Almost all of the nuclear power we use on Earth today uses water as a basic coolant. The heavy water reactor will use about 0.7% of the uranium's energy value, and the light water reactor will use about half of 1%. They both do terrible. You went camping and you built a fire. Stuff on the edge isn't getting burned very good. The same principle. They'll take out a third of the fuel, and then they'll reshuffle the fuel out to the periphery. The solid fuel will begin to swell and crack. This is actually a gap in the fuel. When the fuel swells and the clad can't hold it anymore, it's time to remove the fuel from the reactor. At this point, only a small amount of the energy has been consumed. When we first load nuclear fuel, it is entirely uranium, and most of that is uranium-238. As it burns down to the year, two years, and then three years, you see those are the fission products, and then these transuranics. The hatch at the bottom gives away the fact that the only fraction that has been truly burned is the fraction you see kind of in those light pastel colors. In light water reactors, if you allow fuel to be uncovered and heat up, the zirconium cladding will react with steam to yeah. form hydrogen. So they have a series of emergency systems designed to always keep the core covered with water. We saw the failure of this at Fukushima Daiichi. You know, they had multiple backup diesel generators, and each one probably had a very high probability of turning on. The tsunami came and knocked them all out. Anna, tell me what the latest is in relation to the third nuclear explosion. How worried are people? The news, oh, we had a nuclear explosion. I'm like, no, we didn't. It wasn't a nuclear explosion. It was a hydrogen gas explosion. The oxygen has a covalent bond with two hydrogens gamma or a neutron. Knock the hydrogens clean off. Let me diss on water a few more times. At normal pressures, water will boil at 100 degrees Celsius. This isn't nearly hot enough to generate electricity effectively. So water-cooled reactors have to run at over 70 atmospheres of pressure. You have to build a water-cooled reactor as a pressure vessel. Number one accident people worry about with this kind of reactor, all of a sudden, pressure is lost in the reactor. Water that's being held 300 Celsius flashes to steam. Its volume increases roughly by a factor of a thousand. This building is the size it is, and it's the way it is, precisely to accommodate this event. When you put water under extreme pressure, like anything else, it wants to get out of that extreme pressure. Physical mechanisms... A dispersion get, term. Yeah, that can mobilize cesium and iodine. Almost all of the aspects of our nuclear reactors today that we find the most challenging can be traced back to the need to have pressurized water. But as long as the reactor was as small as the submarine intermediate reactor, which was only 60 megawatts, then containment shell was absolute. It was safe. But when you went to 1,000 megawatt reactors, you could not guarantee this. Weinberg was the original inventor of the pressurized water reactor. He got his patent for it in 1947. A tricky thing to have the inventor of the light water reactor advocating for something very, very, very different. The molten salt breeder was one thing that he had a feeling in his heart for. Molten salt is one of the best decisions I made, I think. High temperature is easier than high pressure. He didn't like the fact that it had to run at really high pressure. In some very remote situation, conceive of the containment being breached. Making enough of a stink. Congressional leader named Chet Holofield told Alvin Weinberg, if you're so concerned about the safety of nuclear energy, it might be time for you to leave the nuclear business. And Weinberg was really kind of horrified that they would have this response to him because he wasn't questioning the value or the importance of nuclear energy. He was questioning had the right path been taken. The molten salt reactor experiment was one of the most important and I must say brilliant achievements of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. You nuclear engineers are probably going to think those are fuel rods. They're not. They're graphite. The fuel was a liquid that flowed through channels in this graphite. Instead of having solid fuel and a liquid moderator, liquid fuel and a solid moderator. One of the hardest things to get around is the large, heavy pressure vessel that's required when you use pressurized water reactors. Water actually is really good from a heat transfer perspective. It's good at carrying heat per unit volume. Salts are just as good at carrying heat per unit volume, but salts don't have to be pressurized. And that, if you remember nothing else of what I say tonight, remember that one fact. Once they melt, they have a thousand degrees C of liquid range. Science allows you to look at, at everyday objects for what they really are, chemically and physically. And it really makes you look twice at the world around you. Your table salt is frozen. That's a really strange thing to think about. Your table salt on your kitchen table is it's frozen. A nuclear reactor is a rough place for normal matter. The nice thing about a salt is it's formed from a positive ion and a negative ion, like sodium's positively charged and chlorine's negatively charged. And they go, we're not really going to bond. We're just going to kind of 
associate one with another, you know? And that's what's called an ionic bond. Yeah, you're kind of friends, you know, you're... Facebook friends. Facebook, yeah, Facebook <laughs> friends. All right, well, it turns out this is a really good thing for a reactor because a reactor is going to take those guys and just smack them all over the place with gammas and neutrons and everything. And the good news is, is they don't really care who they particularly are next to. As long as there's an equal number of positive ions and negative ions, the big picture is happy. A salt is composed of the stuff that's in this column, the halogens, and the stuff that's in the, these columns, the alkalis and the alkaline earth. Fluorine is so reactive with everything, but once it's made a salt, a fluoride, then it's incredibly chemically stable and non-reactive. Sodium chloride, table salt, or potassium iodide, they have really high melting points. And we like the lower melting points of fluoride salts. Liquid fluoride reactors with their low pressure operation are particularly suitable to modular construction. Sometimes people go, oh, you're working on liquid fluorine reactors. No, I am not working on liquid fluorine reactors. We're going to with fluoride reactors, and there's a big difference between those two. One is going to explode. The other one is, like, super duper stable. In the chemical conditions that you have with water, highly oxidized conditions, cesium and iodine are very volatile. Whereas in a salt reactor... There's nothing that cesium loves more than fluorine. It will compete with anything else to grab a hold of fluorine, and cesium fluoride is very low volatility and very high solubility in salt. So no aerosols. Safety is one of the most important reasons to consider very seriously molten salt reactors. And this is because of the clever implementation that was demonstrated in the molten salt reactor experiment of the freeze plug and the drain tank. This is something that perhaps was not getting enough attention in the early 1970s. Now we know that if we want to have the public accept nuclear reactor technology, it has got to be very safe and it has got to be something that is easily explained to people. Now I've explained the safety basis of the molten salt reactor to people many times and I haven't had anyone who's unable to get it. Frozen plug? That's it. That's um, it? A flattened pipe with uh, electrical heat, resistance heat on that one. So you invented the frozen plug room. A small port in the bottom of the reactor. And to keep the port plugged, they had a blower that would blow cool gas over it. So there was a little plug of frozen salt there. Well, if the power went out, the blower turned off, and the heat would melt the frozen plug, and guess what? Psh, everything would drain out of the reactor into this drain tank, and the difference between the drain tank and the reactor vessel was the reactor vessel was not meant to lose any thermal energy. The only place you wanted to lose thermal energy was to give it up in the primary heat exchanger. The drain tank, on the other hand, is designed to maximize the rejection of thermal energy to the environment. And one of the hard things about designing a nuclear reactor is designing to not lose any heat while you're running it, but then to turn around and try to keep it cool if something goes wrong. So there are two conflicting things. The great thing about uh, liquid fluoride reactors is you can design them completely separately. You can say, here's my reactor and it's designed to make heat, and here's my drain tank and it's designed to cool in all situations. If something happens where that fuel drains away from that graphite, criticality is no longer possible. The reactor is subcritical, fission stops. And there's no way to restart it without reloading the fuel back into the core. This is such a remarkable feature. And it really is unique to having this liquid fuel form and to having something that can operate at standard pressure. You can't do this in solid fuel. If you do this in solid fuel, it's called a meltdown. Making solid nuclear fuel is a complicated and expensive process. People recycle cans, they recycle papers. Why not candles? I say we put a bin out, let people bring back their old drippings at their convenience. It's like those bags that say, I used to be a plastic bottle. We could have a bin that said, I used to be another candle. By weight, a paraffin candlestick and gasoline contain about the same amount of energy. Why don't cars run on paraffin wax? Because the inside of your car might need to look like this or like this. What process do we run chemically based on solids? We don't. Everything we do, we use as liquids or gases because we can mix them completely. You can take a liquid, you can fully mix it. You can take a gas, you can fully mix it. You can't take a solid and fully mix it unless you turn it into a liquid or a gas. I shall never forget my wonderment as I stood next to the unshielded steel cans only a few days earlier had been mixed with millions of curies of radioactivity. We were particularly proud of this because that tiny chemical plant was large enough to decontaminate the core of a one gigawatt molten salt breeder. Thorium does not have a volatile hexafluoride. You can fluorinate it and fluorinate it and fluorinate all you want, and it will not change chemical state. It will stay thorium tetrafluoride. Uranium, on the other hand, does have a volatile hexafluoride. 
And this is why many of us feel that the uranium thorium fuel cycle is a perfect fit with a molten salt reactor. This same trick doesn't work, by the way, in uranium plutonium fuels. They both have volatile hexafluorides, and so you can't undergo a separation using the simple technique of fluoride volatility. Can you tell me what the thinking is on thorium? The first commercial reactor operated in this country at Chippingport was based on thorium fuel. My constituents were always asking me about this. Does thorium have a place in our nuclear future? I see no compelling reason to move towards a thorium cycle. Uh, there was a recent report done by the Nuclear Energy Agency of the OECD on thorium systems. Can you make them work? Yes, you can make them work. Is there an advantage to doing it? I haven't seen it. Does the OECD report evaluate Alvin Weinberg's concept of the molten salt breeder and identify technical challenges which may impede development? Of those 11 pages in a 133-page report, one sentence does so. This one gigawatt design was a thermal reactor with graphite-moderated core that required heavy chemical fuel salt treatment with a removal time of approximately 30 days for soluble fission products, a drawback that could potentially be eliminated by using a fast spectrum instead. In a fast spectrum reactor, uranium and thorium perform the same. In a solid fuel reactor, uranium is a superior choice. It is only in Alvin Weinberg's thermal spectrum molten salt breeder reactor that thorium's advantages become clear. Let's reword it for clarity. This one gigawatt design was a thermal reactor with graphite moderated core that avoided the drawbacks of fast spectrum by removing soluble fission products through the use of chemical fuel salt treatment. The successful breeder will be the one that can deal with the spent fuel most rationally, either by achieving extremely long burnup or by greatly simplifying the entire recycle step. This is kind of like a kidney for the nuclear reactor. This is how long it takes our spent fuel to reach the same radioactivity as, as natural uranium. It's about 300,000 years. If you can keep all the actinides out of the waste stream, then you can really, really shorten that to about 300 years. It's where it's positioned on the periodic table. It goes down the chain into different elements. But if you start a couple of steps to the left along the periodic table, inherently you take out most of the nasties in the waste. If you use thorium with this kind of efficiency, something really amazing becomes possible. Every cubic meter of the earth has got a certain amount of uranium and thorium in it. It's about two cubic centimeters of thorium and half a cubic centimeter of uranium. If you can use thorium to the kind of efficiencies that we're talking about today, this has the energy equivalent of more than 30 cubic meters of the finest crude oil or anthracite coal. So this is like taking worthless piece of dirt anywhere in the world and turning it into multiple of the finest chemical energy resources we have. I mean, that's absolutely amazing. Now, good news is we don't have to mine average continental crust for thorium. You can see that uranium-235 is like on par with silver and platinum. Can you imagine burning platinum for energy? And that's what we're doing with our nuclear energy sources today. We're burning this extremely rare stuff and not thorium. As a natural resource, the appeal of thorium over uranium is that thorium has zero environmental cost to acquire. We can power our civilization on thorium without opening a single thorium mine. It is already a plentiful byproduct of existing mining operations. Bleached by water, U compounds were widely dispersed, scattered far and wide. U compounds today are found as complex, dilute deposits containing tetra, penta, and hexavalent uranium. Unlike uranium, tetravalent thorium, and it's constantly tetravalent, resists weathering. Thorium thus remained concentrated where it first wound up, within easy reach. And your deposit has 8% rare earths. It may have 14% thorium. One rare earth, and usually one thorium atom. There's so much rare earths that we're throwing away because of thorium. Rare earth materials are used to make high-tech products like advanced batteries that power everything from hybrid cars to cell phones. We want our companies building those products right here in America. But to do that, American manufacturers need to have access to rare earth materials, which China supplies. So I have a friend who's trying to start a rare earth mine in Missouri, and all he wants the government to do is to just let him put the thorium aside for future use. So I asked him, Jim, how much thorium do you think you'll be pulling up a year? He goes, 
I think about 5,000 tons. Is that a lot? There was 60 people sitting on the other side of the podium going, do you think there's a stable supply? <laughs> 5,000 tons of thorium would supply the planet with all of its energy for a year. So your one mine would bring up enough thorium without even trying to power the entire planet. It's found in tailings piles. It's found in ash piles. And he goes, and there's like a zillion other places on Earth that are just like my mine. It's a nice mine, but it's not unique. It's not like this is the one place on Earth where this is found. We could use thorium about 200 times more efficiently than we're using uranium now. This reduces the waste generated over uranium by factors of hundreds and by factors of millions over fossil fuels. Why nuclear energy? Why molten salt reactor? And why thorium? And last but not the least, why China is the first one to eat the crap? That's Chinese saying. Chinese Academy of Sciences has begun an effort to develop what they call TMSR, Thorium Molten Salt Reactor. It's along these same lines, and they are well-funded and well-staffed. We used to have a dream, if we can produce a clean electricity, then we can drive our electrical car. However, as of today, it's all gasoline cars, so it makes our job even impossible. We need a revolutionary something happen. It's very compelling work. The Chinese are definitely in the lead right now on this. The white thorium. Why MSR? Low pressure here, more safety. We also end up with the high temperature. We need high temperature. Then we can convert the CO2, which is not the waste at all. It's a, it's a raw material for our chemicals, in fact. We need the energy to convert them, but we need the high temperature. China export. A lot of the energy here in China is not for consume, it's for production. We saw the other day how electrical power was used to make steel from recycled materials. We load scrap into large haul trucks and they back up into this bucket and dump scrap inside. A lot of energy consumption is largely industrial processes unbelievably optimized process. There's not the same room for improvement. The nature of waste heat doesn't lend itself very well to conventional Rankine cycles. We probably captured 90% of what's to be captured. Chasing the last 10% is pretty expensive. Those operations couldn't proceed if they thought in two hours they might or might not have power. They would not be able to make steel that way. They have to have reliable energy sources. So you've been able to drop your power consumption per ton almost about a third, it looks like. Probably since the, uh, the mid, early 80s. So besides your scrap material input, what's your next largest cost on production? Electricity. Electricity. This is a recycling facility. An electric arc furnace turns scrap metal into steel alloy for automobiles, consumer products, and infrastructure such as pipes and bridges. This is a sorting facility. We are all familiar with sorting as we put bottles aside for funding drives. Do not mistake sorting for recycling. Sorting is labor intensive. Recycling is energy intensive. This steel recycling plant runs 24 seven. Without reliable clean energy, a closed loop society becomes impossible. Most people don't understand everything you look at, touch, feel, anything is tangible. There's energy behind it, a lot of it. That was one thing that always attracted me about the notion of exploring space. I'm an aerospace engineer by training. I went to Georgia Tech, got my master's degree there. Now I spent 10 years working at NASA. This is the kind of community I was thinking of. You know, if you were going to live on the moon or Mars, there was no pit over here and pit over there. Every atom of nitrogen or oxygen or hydrogen became precious to you. And when I would tell people, why were we doing NASA? That was the most effective thing. It was the whole idea of recycling and what we would learn from exploring space. What prevents us from doing that right now on Earth? I mean, why do we have to go to space to learn how to be really, really good recyclers? Why don't we recycle like that on Earth? It's energy, you know, energy has to be really, really cheap or the penalty has to be really, really bad. Now in space, the penalty was really, really bad. If you didn't recycle, you ran out of air and water. But on the ground, you need to have really, really cheap energy. I worked a lot of my career in solar power systems. It's just that I'm a lot more aware of their limitations. The moon orbits the Earth once a month. For two weeks, the sun goes down and your solar panels don't make any energy. 
It's easy to forget about that in our world here on Earth because we're so abstracted from our energy sources. Food is at the grocery store and that we flush the toilet and the waste goes somewhere where somebody takes care of them. And we don't really think about the, the flow of energy that makes all of this possible. With the energy generated, we can actually recycle all of the air, water, and waste products within the lunar community. In fact, doing so would be an absolute requirement for success. We could grow the crops needed to feed the members of the community even during the two-week lunar night using light and power from the reactor. It kind of was this microcosm that made it easier for me to understand the bigger picture that we do have going on here on Earth and how we can make that, that bigger picture better, how we can enhance our quality of life on Earth. We're still going to need liquid fuels for vehicles and machinery. We could generate hydrogen by splitting water and combining it with carbon harvested from CO2 in the atmosphere, making fuels like methanol, ammonia, and dimethyl ether, which could be a direct replacement for diesel fuels. Imagine carbon neutral gasoline and diesel, sustainable and self-produced. The Atomic Energy Commission, unfortunately, did not uh, share their zeal to continue with the technology. Put your hand on your desk, take everything that has to do with molten salt, sweep it off, and you're finished. Stop that reactor experiment. Fire everybody. I didn't see it coming. The project was terminated, but I still think that people will come back to this reactor. I hope that after I'm gone, people will say, hey, these guys had a pretty good idea. Let's go back to it. We share the dream that was put forward by Dr. Alvin Weinberg long ago of a world set free by essentially unlimited energy source. To me, it is a miracle. It's a miracle that there's a material on Earth that has such remarkable energy density that even worthless dirt is transformed into an energy resource greater than the richest crude oil or anthracite coal or any other resource you can imagine. To me, that is, that is truly a miracle. When I pitched this story to Wired Magazine, there's six editors around a table, and they're pretty well-informed science and technology journalists, and not a single one of them had heard of thorium. Richard Weinberg, he said, most of my father's papers are at the Oak Ridge Children's Museum. Literally, there was a big walk-in closet. I'm realizing as I go through these Oak Ridge documents how limited their distribution was. On the very last page of everyone, there's a distribution. There's about 40 people. And you're like, so best case scenario, 40 people read what I'm holding in my hand 50 years ago. Around 2004, Kirk Sorensen came to visit us at Berkeley because we'd been working on molten salt reactor technology and doing some of the early studies. He had a stack of CD-ROMs, and that was a treasure trove. We have been able to access and also to disperse an amazing amount of information. Kirk gave me some CDs, and then he put them on the internet. That was a game changer. That was an inflection point. Unless you were physically with me, and I could bring down a copy of fluid fuel reactors showing the molten salt reactor in it, and the aircraft reactor experiment. Matter of fact, it has a picture, and in the background is a stepladder. It shows you the scale. It was half the size of your refrigerator, and it put out 2 million watts of heat. In night, and it operated in 1954. I wasn't even on the planet then. In 2010, some of you may remember, President Obama in a State of the Union address said, We need more production, more efficiency, more incentives. And that means building a new generation of safe, clean nuclear power plants in this country. And both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, stood up like he just talked about motherhood and apple pie or saluted the military. We're all at Oak Ridge. The morning that we showed up, one of the Oak Ridge guys came in with an announcement from the Chinese Academy of Science. We are gonna do this, we're gonna own the IP. So you would think someone in our government would say, maybe you shouldn't keep giving away this information. Coming back for what will be built, again, it's light water reactors. I don't understand how, what's going on here. Why are we spending money to build reactors based on the same concept that we have been building ever since uh, World War II? I believe that the light water reactors for the foreseeable future will be a bridge between the industry of today and an industry of tomorrow. What we've got is not a bridge to tomorrow, but a, but a protection of the status quo. The current system incentivizes reactor designers to develop their first projects outside of the United States. And in fact, this has already happened. NRC regulations specifically 
spell out prohibitions against fluid-filled reactors. You cannot operate fluid-filled reactor more than one megawatt without expensive license process. We'd like the demonstration facility to generate meaningful results for a full-size plant on the order of 20 megawatts thermal. Any smaller than that, and it really... It becomes a different machine. Yeah, but just the, the thermal hydraulics even would be so different that it wouldn't really be a valid comparison. Canada has a, f uh, a fundamentally different regulatory environment for nuclear power, which is, I would say, very progressive. We do feel that we have a competitive advantage by pursuing this technology in Canada, specifically. We don't do big science anymore here in the United States. We don't. China is. India is. The Czech Republic is. Jan Ulich. He's got a great budget, and he bought an obscene amount of fly for pennies on the dollar from Oak Ridge National Laboratories because he's doing big science over there. And we, we basically gave it away. Currently, there is no way for us to build a prototype facility or move beyond the laboratory scale work that we're currently doing. We want more than anything to do this in the US, but we've been forced to keep an open mind with respect to the other, the other pathways we could take. So we formed Flyb Energy to realize modular, two-fluid, molten salt reactors that implement the thorium fuel cycle. We're the town that put man on the moon. It's also very well located within the United States, connected to an extensive rail network. We're also fairly close to Oak Ridge National Labs, the birthplace of the molten salt reactor experiment, which ran for almost five years and demonstrated fundamental compatibilities of the graphite, the salt, and the Hastelloy material that contains the reactor. It was very successful. I've had the good pleasure of speaking with some of the gentlemen who worked on this project long ago. Do you think building molten salt reactors in the future would be a good idea? Oh, heavens yes. Dick, what do you think? <laughs> I, I think it would be a very good idea. It would be tragic if we don't follow this and end up uh, buying another technology uh, from foreign powers in other parts of the world. China currently makes my squash rackets and pretty soon they're gonna be making my reactors if we don't uh, turn this around a little bit. China's developing this thing very rapidly with the help of our national labs, with the Department of Energy. They've publicly said they're gonna control this. How is it that we created it here, the ultimate gift to humanity, and how is it that China will deliver this system and not the US? It would be crazy for us to, to give up the technology that we developed back in the 1960s to, to another country. It might not seem like it, but it's the middle of the day here in Beijing. The air is so polluted that it's darkened the sky. But the thing is, speaking as an internationalist, if you want to do something about global warming, it would be a great thing if China built thorium-based reactors instead of coal plants. These guys are probably going to pull it off. And, you know, good, I hope they do. China definitely needs clean energy, absolutely. And thorium will provide them clean energy for hundreds of thousands of years. But frankly, I'd really like us to be able to do it too. And I'd like it to be something maybe that we developed rather than that we go buy. We buy a lot of things from China already. You know, I mean, it's not as if we're not buying enough things from China. We are definitely keeping them busy. So let, you know, let's, let's go develop thorium. And uh, that's really what I'd like to do. The last operational molten salt reactor shut down in the United States in 1969. It ran in a remote location. Research documents were kept in a walk-in closet. For three decades, we didn't even know this was an option. Then in 2002, Ornell's molten salt documentation is scanned into PDF and made accessible to some NASA employees. 2004, Kirk Sorensen delivers CD-ROMs full of molten salt research to national labs and universities. Dr. Per Peterson receives a copy. 2006, Kirk moves the scanned research onto his website. 2008, molten salt reactor lectures begin at Googleplex, hosted on Google's YouTube channel. 2009, the very first thorium conference is held. 
Wired Magazine runs a feature story on Thorium 2010. American Scientist runs a feature on Thorium. International Thorium conferences begin. Server logs show Chinese students downloading molten salt reactor PDFs from Kirk's website. 2011. China announces their intention to build a Thorium molten salt reactor. In the US, Flyb Energy is founded. Transatomic Power is founded. 2012. Baroness Bryony Worthington tours Ornell's historic molten salt reactor experiment, which has never been made open to the public. Kun Chen visits Berkeley, California, telling us 300 Chinese are working full-time on molten salt reactors. 2013, Terrestrial Energy is founded. 2014, Thorcon is founded. Moltex is founded. Seaborg Technologies are founded. Copenhagen Atomics are founded. 2015, India reveals their new facility for molten salt preparation and purification. A flood of technical details and technology assessments are released by molten salt startups including Lifter EPRI, a collaboration between Flyb Energy and Southern Company to assess technological readiness of Flyb Energy's molten salt breeder reactor design, the Lifter. China announces that now 700 engineers are working on their molten salt reactor program. 2016, Peter Thiel, an investor in the molten salt startup Transatomic Power, contributes over a million dollars to Donald Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. Miriam Tonloto releases a feature-length documentary about molten salt reactors called Thorium, the Far Side of Nuclear Power. Dr. James Hansen tells Rolling Stone magazine that we should develop molten salt reactors powered by thorium. Oak Ridge discovers actual film footage of the molten salt reactor itself. Produced in 1969, it was forgotten in storage for over 45 years. It offers up our first and only glimpse of an operating molten salt reactor. 2017 To propel this new era of American energy dominance. First, we will begin to revive and expand our nuclear energy sector, which produces clean, renewable, and emissions-free energy. President Donald Trump observes nuclear power is both a renewable resource and an emissions-free source of energy. A complete review of U.S. nuclear energy policy will help us find new ways to revitalize this crucial energy resource. And I know you're very excited about that, Rick. HR 590, Advanced Nuclear Technology Development Act, is passed through the House of Representatives. Flybe Energy reveals Lifter 49, a new two-fluid reactor designed to turn thorium into life-saving medical isotopes. Just like original Lifter, it is a machine that recycles wasted material such as mine tailings, coal ash piles, and now used fuel rods into enormous amounts of energy. Back in the 60s, Alvin Weinberg saw the molten salt reactor as a means of addressing energy pollution and the need for clean water. Power centers would co-locate energy-intensive manufacturing and small modular reactors. Surplus power would be sold to nearby communities. He knew energy was the ultimate raw material. The more energy you have, the easier it is to recycle and use virgin materials more efficiently. Given enough power, we can pull carbon right out of the atmosphere or ocean. China announced their plans to develop and commercialize a thorium-fueled molten salt reactor in 2011. I'd finally like a president of the United States to know what molten salt reactors are and why they are. Every time mankind has been able to access a new source of energy, it has led to profound societal implications. The Industrial Revolution and the ability to use chemical fuels was what finally did in slavery. Human beings have had slaves for thousands and thousands of years. And when we learned how to make carbon our slave instead of other human beings, we started to learn how to be able to be civilized people. We live much better lives today because we have learned how to use carbon. Okay. What about thorium? Thorium has a million times the energy density of a carbon-hydrogen bond. What could that mean for human civilization going out thousands, tens of thousands of years into the future? Because we're not going to run out of this stuff. Once we've learned how to use it at this kind of efficiency, we will never run out. It is simply too common.